motion also asks the proposal to Council to uh, draw this to the attention of the local government association. I'm happy to, to do this. And there clearly are a number of uh, actions locally that we, this motion is asking us to take, uh, notably around uh, our own fleet um, that we operate in the council, and also uh, for us to write to schools, because clearly many of our schools um, commission um, these mini buses, these coaches, uh, to ferry children to and from swimming parks and other events. And, 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 and I'm really keen that schools um, adopt this, this policy for the operators that they, uh, they, they help. I'm pleased to say, Madam Mayor, just on, in terms of Mersey Travel, Mersey Travel recently confirmed that all operators of commercial services, large and small, and also those running supported services on behalf of Mersey Travel, have committed to tyres on their vehicles being no older than 10 years old. And I thank Mersey Travel and all the reps uh, from, from this council on Mersey Travel for getting behind that. So, in closing, Madam Mayor, I, I do believe that unless legislation on this is passed, it, it will be very difficult to enforce tyre age limits. And sadly, people will continue to be killed and injured due to old tyres. Uh, you know, in any civilised society, um, we should not let this be happening. So I would call upon the council to please support this, this motion and Francis Morgan's campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you. Clearly, in this case, we're up to the 
19 years old. Um, it, it is absolutely deplorable. Um, I will do all I can both as a member of this council um, and I have to say as a mother as well. I mean, can you imagine any of us here who are about this happening? Um, because Francis has got absolutely nowhere at the moment. Um, and I have to say, Steve Rotherham, um, when he was at an MP, actually raised this in Parliament. Um, and we were grateful for that at the time. But clearly, it needs a much wider agenda. And it needs, it needs really um, the government ministers um, presently, and those in the past, as I say, uh, have, have let us down, but most of all, have let Francis down. And uh, we, we pledge to do all we can to make sure that that doesn't continue. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thanks, Councillor Brady. Uh, Councillor Stewart.
was in law enforcement, when we did certain um, projects on taxis, you would stop a vehicle and it would be quite clear that that vehicle had very, very poor um, tyres. And yet it had only passed through the council with obviously suitable tyres. And it goes back to the point of my colleague at Council Remington, is that that's, that's also happening in the taxi world, whereby there's a swapping of, of, of vehicle um, tyres between a number of different taxis. They only get through the MMT and then clearly it is equally as a safe vehicle. So I think we do have some control here of some power that we can also do some of the licensing side of things for taxis because it is not just coaches. Coaches are obviously more likely to kill more people, but I do think taxis equally should come under this purview. And it's something I think we have to consider maybe for our own licensing powers would maybe extend uh, how we review the age of some of the taxis because quite frankly I think we've certainly seen some very poor examples of taxis in the last couple. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Really, I just want to make a comment relating to one large element of this that we seem to be ignored, and that's HGVs and commercial vehicles. I'm not entirely sure whether this proposed change in the legislation would cover those as well. But if you think, just generally, how many eight-wheel vehicles are romping up and down the motorways, quite often going faster, overloaded, um, and we don't seem to take account of that at all because they can cause some massive damage and uh, death just as much as people riding in coaches are. So I would like to see added to this uh, question about uh, PSVs that we add HGVs to it as well and make sure that we don't have HGVs travelling around with dangerous time. I've seen some HGVs parked where they're all, and I think it goes down to what my colleague and Leslie Rennie was saying. People take the lousy tyres off a vehicle before it's tested and goes to a large MOT organisation for commercial vehicles, change them and then put the old ones back on. We've got to find a more robust way of dealing with this problem than we cost them. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move on to the next item. Um, Councillor Hodgson, you Motion. Uh, can I say on behalf of the Conservative Group, uh, how pleased we are to welcome Joe Walsh back uh, to the Council Chamber. Uh, the, <laughs> we very rarely agree, Madam Mayor, but I do appreciate the comments he makes sometimes at planning. Uh, so welcome back to uh, help Councillor Walsh. Uh, Madam Mayor, on my second point, uh, while we welcome Councillor Walsh back, can I say, and I've noticed this over the last sort of, 10 years or so, how disappointing it is that nowadays senior directors of this council do not sit in the middle of this council chamber for the duration of the debates. And that's not being clear, which is the fact that senior directors, some are here tonight, but most are not. Uh, how can they possibly reflect the views of council if they're not here to hear the views of council? Uh, so I think senior directors are obliged to attend this council meeting and to sit in the middle of the council chamber and to listen to what the members are saying. That's just a personal view, I'm aware. Uh, certainly, now, as we go on to the, uh, sort of the motion before us in terms of tyres, uh, I have no connection to this other than the fact that I spotted a uh, debate which took place at Liverpool City Council uh, on Twitter. Uh, as a result of that, via Twitter, the power of social media, uh, I contacted Tyres and with the uh, agreement of the leader of the council, the leader of the Liberal Democrats uh, and uh, Council Cleary, uh, met with the cabinet member for highways and transportation, Francis Malloy, uh, who we've heard has lost her son, who was 18 at the time, and also uh, with Zoe Wallace, uh, one of their campaigners from the group uh, that's been set up to press for this change in the law. Madam Mayor, I think it's worth noting, uh, picking up on the points that Councillor Spruit made, uh, Michael Mullen was 18 uh, when he died, Kerry Ogden was 23 when she died, and the driver Colin Dolby was 53 when he died. All three deaths could have been avoided, Madam Mayor, if the guidelines uh, that we know that exist on this particular uh, vehicle uh, were mandatory. And, uh, it's been argued that uh, making this guidance mandatory is somehow anti-competitive. And I have to say it is anti-competitive to allow car boys to operate uh, by not following the guidance, but they operate such as National Express do follow the guidance. If anything, comp competition relies on a level playing field. At the moment that does not exist. Certainly from a parent's point of view, I can't imagine anything if, for those parents who are in the room, of wondering uh, what their children were going to go up to when they arrived at the festival, not giving a second care in the world to whether they were going to arrive at that festival. 
Our, our main worry, Madam Mayor, is that passengers around this country are getting on vehicles that they think are safe, but which are not safe. And Madam Mayor, uh, on behalf of myself, and hopefully my group, and certainly the Deputy Leader of the Deputy Group, we have no hesitation whatsoever in stating to this government, or any government, that they are wrong not to make this legislation. This government so far hasn't done it, the previous government hasn't done it. Madam Mayor, hopefully with council support tonight, we can persuade the government to act and to make this mandatory. In two weeks' time, Madam Mayor, myself and the Conservative Group will be meeting with the new road safety minister and we will be pressing this issue on him at that meeting. Madam Mayor, I would like to finish by thanking council, but also thanking Frances Malloy for what she has done, the dedication she has shown in what can only be the most difficult circumstances for any parent to face this kind of dilemma and to face this kind of tragedy in her family's life. So on behalf of Council, Madam Mayor, can I thank you for your good support and that we will urgently contact all party leaders and the DFT to urge this government to change the law. Yeah.
provoke a huge protest, the Clinical Commissioning Group and World Community Trust could not have done it more efficiently. <coughs> and a huge protest is exactly what they did get. A petition of over 5,000 signatures gathered in just five days. All four would all have up in arms calling for Eastern to reopen and for assurances that other walking centres are safe. And the scrutiny committees from two local authorities were around Cheshire West and Chester, demanding to know why the statutory duty to report significant changes in the delivery of health services for scrutiny had been ignored. <coughs> a scrutiny committee is the voice of local people, and it's an important role, and those of us who are involved in it take it very seriously. Failure to comply with the statutory duty should only happen in exceptional circumstances, and the Adult Care and Health Committee were completely unconvinced by the confused and conflicting reasons we were given. First, we were told that the urgency was because of risks to patient and staff safety at A&E in Arrow Park. Then, that the Secretary of State for Health has his eye on A&E at Arrow Park, which well, well he might as performance there has been deteriorating steadily for the last five years. And finally, that NHS England has produced a directive that front door screening should be established in A&E departments by mid-September. There was no adequate explanation given as to why longer term planning hadn't taken place to address this five year deterioration in performance, or why the streaming, which had been introduced in 2015 as a result of a recommendation of the People Overview and Scrutiny Committee on Reducing Avoidable Hospital Admissions, had been withdrawn after just a couple of months. But the reason I was given at that time was that it wasn't effective in reducing the pressure on AE departments, the AE department. Suddenly, it's become urgent to put it in place to protect the uh, staff and patient safety. I'm sorry, but what we were told just wasn't credible. The good thing that came out of the committee was the firm assurance by Simon Banks that this closure was temporary and the walk-in centre will reopen. So that is good, but it isn't quite good enough because what we want now is a date for the reopening. The committee spokespersons have written since to Mr Banks to remind him of our formal request to reopen the walk-in centre and to ask the date for that. But as yet, we've had no reply. I'm sure by now the CCG chief understands that for the public, there's a credibility gap that can only be filled by actions which follow his words. But there's an underlying issue here, and that is that the closure of the Eastern Centre was not the only report that we had to request to come to committee on September the 13th, because the statutory duty had not been complied with. There were two other service changes that haven't been reported. We know that there are further massive changes in our much valued health service on the horizon. There's a review of the urgent care provision due in November, and of course, STP changes as yet unknown. The committee were given a firm assurance last year by the then CCG team that no single change of provision would be implemented until there had been the opportunity to scrutinise it. We need to have confidence that the health commissions now will open up their plans to scrutiny before they are implemented and that the voice of rural residents will be heard before decisions are made about how their healthcare needs will be met. Health providers must understand that they cannot act in isolation. We know that there is a health crisis and health service crisis in this country. It's a crisis exacerbated by underfunding, and I see the Conservative Amendment makes much of the additional funding to rural. But that is irrelevant if the funding doesn't match the demand. And there's been a failure to provide for an increasing ageing population and for improved treatment options. The quote that should send a chill through us all comes from Professor Mike Richards, Chief Inspector of Hospitals for the CQC, and he says the NHS is standing on a burning platform. The public, the public pay gap has resulted in a staffing crisis with the most experienced qualified staff being forced out of their professions by simply not being able to provide for their families and the sheer pressure of work. People have to wait in ambulances to get in any departments and they have long waits for treatment. Waits for referral to hospital are longer than they should be, with GP surgeries overstretched, so increasing the pressure on the A&E departments. But we also know that the public value their NHS and those dedicated staff who work in it. And as the reaction to the Eastern show of the closure has shown, they will fight to protect it. And councillors, we will fight with them. Please do support this notice of motion.
of this temporary enclosure at least and walking centre. And the motion passed by the committee reflected that. And as uh, Councillor McLaughlin has referred to, the chair and spokesman sent a letter to the CCG on that very subject. The problem, I suppose, for this side of the chamber is that some of the other items that are included in the notice motion, because Madam Mayor, the financial system, situation left behind by the outgoing Labour government in 2010 is still casting a long shadow. It's a fact, Madam Mayor, that we've spent a higher proportion of our GDP on health than many other European countries, including Finland, Spain and Italy. Another fact is that additional money has been put into the NHS by this government. And the recent uh, manifesto had 8 billion more for the NHS. There is never going to be enough. There is never going to be enough. There have been many injections of cash. But Madam Mayor, the, the NHS was designed in an era gone by when the, the health of the public was very different to what it is today. These days, two thirds of the NHS budget goes on 15 million people in the country who have a long term condition. Patients with dementia, diabetes, arthritis, and hypertension take up half of all GP appointments. Two thirds of our patients and 70% of inpatient beds. These are some of the challenges which the system faces as it stands. And as the population continues to age, perhaps particularly in rural, I don't know, they will probably increase in number. <laughs> the challenge for our NHS colleagues is that when they want to change structures to reflect that change, then we will get very exercised about it because we're concerned about the impact on our residents. Madam Mayor, we do look forward to seeing Easton's Walking Centre reopen. We will be joining in with and engaging in the review of urgent care in November so that we can work for all the residents of Wirral and seek further improvements in patient care. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Right, let's open to the now. Councillor Maxim.
back with food and beverage and no weapon. It wasn't being soppy or soggy looking back. It was bearing in mind the circumstances and health of the people around in that period and the challenges they faced with the poor diet, the poor housing, the chronic conditions that people suffered. And the key to all this debate is not allowing those conditions to return again, which is why I put that point in. As to our discussions with the CCG, they were somewhat fraught at times, because we didn't feel that we were getting all the information that was being requested. And that's why I was delighted to take part of this spokesperson from the other parties in writing that joint letter. It is very frustrating to hear that even this evening it's not actually being responded to in writing. We had a meeting the other night where some of the warm, welcoming sounds were made, but we still haven't got a date or a definite commitment. Because we were told that we must wait to see how A and D performs, it has got to have sustained performance, and that, that was what was, we were supposed to wait upon. So when the word temporary appears in the documentation that the uh, screening committee called F4, it was something of an alarm bell because in their final paragraph they talked about it being a short term action in view of a wider urgent care review. Well, I, I'm not quite used the word in view slightly differently to perhaps they do. We are about to have consultation on the urgent care review starting on November the 27th when the committee will be involved. But I would like to see Easton's Walk in Centre opened long before that, so they can serve the communities of Southern Will in the way it was intended and the way in which it was fought for. Thank you, President. Thank you, President. Thank you, Thank you Madam Mayor. Um, I'd just like to respond to the, the eloquence of, of Wendy's um, summary of the NHS and the figures she used. Madam Mayor, it was just empty rhetoric complete nutter. And when we went back to what the last Labour government left, the last Labour government in 2009-2010 had the highest patient satisfaction in the history of the NHS. Now I'll take you back, Wendy, um, to 1997 when Labour won a resounding um, victory in that general election. Waiting times for operations in 1997 after we had 18 years of Tory rule, I would class it as Tory misrule, where the NHS is concerned, we had 18 month waiting lists. Yeah. Now when Labour went out of office in 2010, waiting times were down to less than 18 weeks. Now I'll also draw your attention um, to the, uh, the Tory party manifesto of 2010 when they promised no top-down reorganisation of the NHS. <laughs> and what happened when you got into office? In, in collusion with the Lib Dems, I might add, we had a top-down reorganisation of the NHS, which cost three and a half billion, not billion, cost three and a half billion pounds. And I'd like to know where that money was spent. Now, you talked about the figures, the NHS asked for 350 million to see them over this winter, and there is going to be a crisis this winter. And that was partly the reason that Easton closed to take the three nurses from Easton Walking Centre to go to Alan Park. If Alan Park was off standing tomorrow, it would fail. And you only need to walk into Alan Park A and E tomorrow and see the corridors full of people on trolleys. And people in this country are dying on trolleys, man and man. And it's a, it's a result of the party offices, the Tory government's austerity plan, which isn't working. We're over a trillion in debt in this country, in spite of austerity. We were told the deficit would have gone by 2015. The Chancellor imposed that target on himself, and he miserably failed to meet it. So please, please, the party officers, don't give us empty rhetoric. Get on to your government, not ours, and the quicker this country sees the back of the Tory government, 
the better when we can get a Labour Party in, in government who the people trust on the NHS and we can put it right. I sit on the, Madam Mayor, I sit on the Council of Governors at Clatterbridge Oncology Centre. It's a centre of excellence. Yeah. At this moment in time, Madam Mayor, there's eight vacancies, and it's a small unit. There is eight vacancies, as I stand tonight, for consultants. Now that is having a great effect on the patients. My daughter worked in, in uh, oncology in, uh, in Clatterbridge for five and a half years, and she left because of the pressure, the strain, she was doing 12 hour shifts as a doctor, nurses who were off sick, and with pressure and strain, she was doing 12 hour shifts, seeing patients at 8 o'clock at night, and she couldn't stand it any longer. And she's now working in our park, which is the strain, I, I believe the NHS has collapsed, Madam Mayor, under the pressure of no finance. Um, so my, my message is, is simple, not empty rhetoric in this chamber, but please get on to your government and tell them the NHS needs more funding and it needs it now. Thank you. Bring 
back euthanasia for houses. Because that's the direction your argument's taken us in. And it's a typical direction that you take and pat yourselves on the back about the way the NHS has improved and the Tory government is absolute nonsense.